product. Okay, so let's go to lane two. Um, so if you have a reaction where there is RAD51 present, but no BRCA2 and no RPA, okay, so in this lane, we just have RAD51, uh, no BRCA2, uh, no RPA. Um, what you see is that the RAD51 can uh, very readily act to catalyze a strand invasion because there's no RPA inhibiting the RAD51 filament formation, right? Um, and so we definitely see that with the production of the strand invasion product. In contrast, if you go to uh, lane 3, which is here, um, what you see in this lane is, um, actually what you do have in this lane, so let me just write it here, lane 3, um, you have RAD51, you have RPA, but no BRCA, BRCA2, okay? Um, so as the result here uh, shows, uh, you can see very little conversion of the double-stranded uh, homologous template to the strand invasion product. So you immediately can infer from this that RPA very strongly inhibits the activity of RAD51. Um, so we can write that down. Uh, RPA inhibits uh, activity of RAD51. And so sort of, uh, you know, then you can, you know, predict that if you coat the single-stranded DNA with RPA, you then prevent RAD51 from associating with it, and then RAD51 can't catalyze the strand invasion. And then finally, the rest of the experiment, um, so if we focus on here, lanes um, 4 to 8, so lanes 4 to 8, um, we have, again, RAD51, we have RPA, and then increasing concentrations of uh, BRCA2. And what you can see from this is uh, as you start increasing the amounts of BRCA2, we uh, start restoring the strand invasion functionality of um, RAD51. So it restores strand invasion of RAD51. And we can see that by the increased uh, production of that strand invasion product. So in the presence of RPA, BRCA2 is required for RAD51 to be able to catalyze the strand invasion. So that's the biochem biochemical evidence that BRCA2 promotes strand invasion by RAD51. So now a few words about uh, non-homologous end joining. All right, so as I mentioned with non-homologous end joining, basically we take a double-stranded break and we're just kind of sticking the ends together. And in an ideal scenario, this can happen in the absence of any processing of the ends. But in reality, it's typically that some end processing does occur. Uh, so often, if we consider, um, we sort of consider the process, uh, in order for end hedge to be preferred, we have to have Q uh, Q binding. Okay, so if you remember, I mentioned that Q binding um, to the ends is essential for N hedge. Right, so just to reiterate, in order for N-hedge to be preferred, we have to have Q-binding to the ends of the double-stranded break. What Q does is it actually functions as a scaffold for assembly of a bunch of N-hedge uh, proteins. Okay, so acts as 
scaffold for uh, assembly of proteins. And I'm not going to bore you with um, these proteins, but the goal of these uh, protein factors is simply to bring the two ends of the DNA together, which is referred to as synapsis, um, as depicted here. Now, if the ends were either flush or had complementary overhangs, this synapsis can literally just be holding the ends together until they become ligated. In contrast, um, you can also have a case where you have uh, termini that aren't necessarily ligatable, and you can still have a synapsis, but it typically uh, depends on very small amounts of homology. So um, there is, I'm just going to kind of draw it here this region right here, um, uh, you know, some annealing and some complementarity, and it's a very small homology as in like one nucleotide. So it's not like you have to conduct a search for a large homologous sequence like RAD51 would do. Uh, this is just simply allowing some annealing at the termini, and this is referred to as microhomology, and it can be as little as one uh, nucleotide. Okay, so this is referred to as micro homology. Uh, so very small homology. And it can be at least, you know, just one nucleotide uh, sequence. And again, this sort of presents a non-ligatable substrate, right? Because we have, you know, this pesky flap. And so typically some end processing uh, occurs. And that involves removing overhangs to present a ligatable uh, termini. Okay, so the goal, again, of end processing is simply to remove any overhangs and present ligatable termini. So removing the flaps, uh, filling in short gaps such that only next remain, and then, of course, this is a substrate for uh, DNA ligase. Substrate for DNA ligase, uh, which can then seal the break. So what I want to show you now is just a couple of ways, um, and this is just a simple example. I'm sure you can imagine many different ways in which, you know, synapsis of two pieces of double-stranded DNA could result in small insertions or deletions. Okay, so this is a very uh, simple example. And in this one um, particularly, um, I think you can see that the ends of the double-stranded break are actually uh, complementary. Right, and that's this section here and this section. So these ends are complementary. Um, so one option here, if we go off uh, to the far left, is that the complementary uh, sequences anneal and basically you restore the original DNA uh, sequence of the break. Okay, so normal synapsis. And that leads to restoring uh, the original uh, sequence. However, um, if we have a synapsis event that is relying on microhomology, so um, we'll look at the figure in the center of the slide. Um, I'm going to show you a microhomology of one nucleotide where you have the A base at the terminal end of this break, so this one here, um, annealing to a T that is one internal to the three prime end of the other strand. So annealing here. Okay, and what happens if you sort of follow this through, um, so we have to make this ligatable, we'd actually have to remove um, this T. So we would have to remove it. 
And then we'd have to polymerize uh, a C and A off of that three prime end, and then uh, a G uh, T T off of the other end. So now, if we actually um, do a comparison between these two, so if we compare, over here under normal synapses, we have no sequence change. And here we have a two base pair insertion. So an incorrect synopsis event. And those are the two bases that have been um, inserted. Okay, so the original sequence was AACA, uh, and with this two base pair insertion, we now have AACA CA. So this is an illustration of how an insertion can result just from an incorrect synapsis event by non-homologous end joining, followed by processing of the ends to give ligatable ter termini. Okay, and then finally, um, if we look at the figure on the right, um, this actually illustrates an example of how you might get a deletion. So in this case, um, the far A over here is annealing uh, to the T at the synapsis uh, step. So this one here. Okay. And what results in that is that you actually produce these two flaps. So this one here. So these are the flaps. And if you process both of these flaps with the structure selective nuclease, so your nuclease uh, removes flaps, um, the end result is that you've essentially uh, deleted three base pairs, right? So that's a three base pair deletion. So if we again compare this to our original sequence, um, it's a three base pair deletion. So repair by non-homologous end joining can restore the original sequence, but it can also result in insertions and deletions. The key with non-homologous end joining is that the deletions and insertions tend to be small. Okay, so uh, the insertions and deletions tend uh, to be small. Right, because they're the result of having to process out small flaps or fill in small gaps. What I want to do now is sort of transition into genome engineering, uh, give you a little bit of rationale of why we bother, and then we'll discuss CRISPR-Cas in terms of how it functions and what potential outcomes of CRISPR-Cas-based DNA cleavages are. Uh, so by way of introduction, just to sort of define the term, genomic uh, genome engineering typically refers to designing and constructing spe site-specific alterations in the DNA sequence, either in a cell or in an organism. These sorts of engineering tools are super useful in our ability to analyze gene functions systematically, and they form sort of the core of microbiology because they allow us to design specific changes in a gene encoding, um, for most cases a protein, to sort of query uh, you know, the relationship between the sequence of a protein and the function uh, of the protein. So these are kind of structure function analyses. Um, so just as an example, you might have a DNA polymerase, you have a crystal structure for it, there, might, uh, there are some amino acids that you can see that are in close contact with the incoming nucleoside, and you want to probe whether that functionality or that binding pocket is important for the ability of the DNA polymerase to function. So one thing you could do is to mutate the DNA polymerase or the gene encoding the DNA polymerase and assess what effect on the DNA polymerase function is. So again, um, these are uh, structure function types of analyses. So structure uh, function uh, analysis. Right, so you could take that, you know, uh, mutant uh, uh, DNA polymerase and, you know, um, 
uh, you can just like evol involve purifying that mutant protein and really basically asking what the effect um, is on the protein's enzymology. It could also involve looking cellularly at what the effect of on the metabolism or life cycle of a cell is in the presence of this mutant protein. So these sort of uh, structure function analyses are really at the heart of our ability to dissect what the function of specific genes and proteins are. So this is a very important tool in understanding basic biology. Um, you know, engineering has found a useful home in recapitulating specific kinds of genome uh, changes or rearrangements that are seen in certain disease states. So that's another uh, reason why we have genome engineering. And I guess one example would be that um, there are a particular family of leukemias that have a very di diagnostic chromosome translocation. And what you can essentially do is reconstruct that chromosome translocation in a model system, say a cell line, to enable you to study the effects of that particular rearrangement. Uh, in a therapeutic sense, there's a lot of interest in genome engineering because, of course, the basis of many human diseases is genetic, and there are at least some diseases where the basis is monogenetic, so that it could afford an opportunity to therapeutically correct errors. Um, it's also useful in engineering animal models, so making uh, disease-relevant alterations and homologous genes in animals to create models for studying. So there's a lot of interest in all kinds of sort of biotech realms in terms of engineering disease and uh, insect uh, resistance. So there's a sort, I'll call it semi-powerful, um, because it's definitely overhyped, but there's a sort of genetic thing referred to as a gene drive, where you can actually use engineering to eliminate unwanted organisms from an ecosystem even. Okay, so those are some of the things that we can do with genome engineering. The beginning of genome engineering was very simple, and it was first accomplished in eukaryotes, uh, in budding yeast to be specific. And what the first sort of instances of gene engineering involved were either inserting or replacing DNA sequences, uh, sequences in the yeast genome. And I guess sort of to make a long story short, what was found that is if you consider the blue um, is the chromosomal locus and the red is the recombinant DNA mo uh, molecule. So this is the chromosomal locus and this is the um, a recombinant DNA molecule that's you know artificially introduced into the yeast cell. The cell essentially sees the ends of this molecule as double-stranded breaks. So it sees a double-stranded break here, and it sees a double-stranded break here. So this is our recombinant. Um, DNA that's introduced into uh, yeast cells. Um, and so, um, you know, these double-stranded ends, either I'm going to bind it up with Ku or I'm going to process it with MNR and CTIP. And so it happens that yeasts greatly prefer homology-directed repair as the pathway. They hardly do NHEDGE at all. So this just turned out to, fortuitously to be a good system for these kinds of studies. So yeast prefer uh, HR over NHEDGE. Okay, so you have these double-stranded ends. The first thing that happens is that you uh, resect them to produce these three prime single-stranded DNA overhangs. So we have these three prime uh, overhangs following resection. And then, of course, uh, these are substrates for um, the assembly of RAD51 filaments. So RAD51. Okay, and then these RAD51 filaments then conduct a homology search, 
and perform a strand invasion and the outcome of this uh, strand invasion. So we get strand invasion. Um, in this instance, you know, once you sort of go through the double holiday junction formation is essentially a, a gene replacement, right? So a gene replacement. where essentially you've kind of hijacked the repair system of the cell to swap this red recombinant thing um, for the native uh, uh, chromosome locus. And so this is a powerful technology because it allowed you to essentially alter genes and uh, DNA sequences at will. And all it required was that you have some homology to the sequence of interest such that you could catalyze you know, this um, strand invasion reaction. Uh, because, of course, this is a homology-directed uh, uh, repair reaction. All right, so the second step of this in terms of improvement was if you present um, double-stranded ends on the incoming DNA, how about if we also present double-stranded ends on the chromosome? And again, you know, if this is the chromosome, um, if you introduce a site-specific double-stranded break, um, so introduce... Uh, double-stranded break onto chromosome. Um, these things then become uh, double-stranded ends, and then everything is subject to you know this three prime overhang creation. So they undergo uh, resection. And now, if there's actual homology between all of these, you don't even have to conduct a strand invasion because essentially you've revealed sequences that can anneal because you've created a single-stranded DNA, not only in the repair template, so this one here, but also on the chromosome. Okay, and, and this is the reaction that follows um, uh, that I showed you earlier, which is single-strand annealing, or SSA if you remember. Um, and what's nice about single-stranded annealing is that it's a lot less complicated than the sort of whole homology directive repair reaction. So one thing is you, you don't need RAD51. Um, because there's no strand invasion. Um, and really all you need to do is anneal the single-stranded DNA. You also don't create uh, double holiday junctions. So DHG, um, so no double holiday junction resolution reaction. And um, all you need to do really is a bit of flat processing. So you need flap processing. And it's essentially getting rid of these regions right here. And then the whole thing um, becomes ligatable. So the whole process works at a very high efficiency. And the key to being able to carry out this process is that you have to be able to make a double-stranded break um, at uh, in whatever target you're interested in such that you can promote this repair reaction efficiently. So you need um, to make the double-stranded break in a target a gene of interest. To make this work. and then go down the SSA repair pathway. Okay, so the engineering part is the site-specific uh, double-stranded break. The rest of it is just normal endogenous cellular double-strand break repair. So the engineering is really just the creation of the break. And so you can imagine the current favorite method of creating a site-specific double-stranded break is to use CRISPR-Cas. So the favored method is to use uh, CRISPR-Cas. 
to do this. All right, let's make some double-stranded breaks. So just as sort of a preamble, CRISPR-Cas9 as a system is super interesting. The biology of what it is, how it works, how it's constituted, and how it was all discovered is all extremely fascinating. You could really spend a, an entire course on it easily. I'm only going to talk about using CRISPR-Cas to actually make double-stranded breaks. So we're just going to kind of treat it like some magical enzyme dropped from heaven, and, uh, but of course it has a biological purpose. It comes from a variety of bacterial species, and in these species it forms a sort of an adaptive immune uh, system where the bacteria generate a memory from a previous viral infection, and they use that memory to resist future viral infections. So the purpose of CRISPR-Cas is not to enable a whole bunch of venture capital. It has a biological purpose, actually. And I guess we're going to talk more about the venture capital uh, side of things. So um, if you're interested in the biology, there's lots of good resources that I can point uh, you in your general direction. So the discovery is pretty interesting, and it's one of many examples that um, makes a good case for using a certain amount of resources in order for uh, scientists to figure out how things work, because applications tend to fall out of interesting biology more readily than they fall out of uh, directed programs. So at any rate, um, CRISPR-Cas, its most popular use is to generate uh, uh, site-specific double-stranded breaks. Okay, so um, to generate site-specific uh, single-stranded breaks. The most common CRISPR-Cas uh, system in current use comes from Streptococcus pyogenes. So the Cas9 in this instance is often referred to as spy Cas9. Okay, so spy Cas9. And um, the genus, you know, and the species uh, is from the name spy. Um, the native system has three components. Okay, so there's three components. They have a polypeptide called Cas9 and two RNA species. And the first, the first RNA species is called CRISPR RNA, so CRRNA. And the second is transactivating CRISPR RNA or the tracer RNA. And basically, uh, in combination, the CRISPR RNA provides the specificity for uh, the cleavage reaction. Okay, so the specificity. for cleavage. So essentially, um, the DNA site selectivity is encoded in the CRISPR RNA, and the tracer RNA is largely uh, structural. Okay, so the CRISPR RNA is the DNA site selectivity. And then the tracer is RG for structure, so structural. And you know this this CRISPR and tracer RNA, the combination of the two, um, has subsequently been engineered um, such that these two RNA molecules are now uh, replaced with uh, a single RNA, um, and this was kind of done by more or less inserting a loop. Um, between these two. Um, so normally uh, the CRISPR RNA contains the, the site selectivity part. Okay, so this part here. 
and it's typically referred to as the guide sequence. So the guide sequence. And it's about 20 nucleotides. And it's what, uh, you know, guides the Cas9 to its cleavage site. And then it also encodes for a bit of um, RNA, which binds to the tracer RNA. So this binds to the tracer RNA. Um, and so one of the advances um, for which uh, Jennifer Dudna and Emmanuel Charpentier won the Nobel Prize for uh, was that they, they created a system where you could fuse the two RNAs into a single chimeric RNA that provides the same functionality and is usually referred to as the short guide RNA or the um, SG RNA. And so they created fused two RNAs with the same functionality. So it's a single guide. And so uh, basically what we've done is reduce this three component system to a two component system. And as you'll see, all that you really need to do to specify where this two component system will create a double stranded break is you just need to play around with the 20 nucleotide guide sequence because that's what specifies where the double stranded break will occur. So all you need to do is uh, change um, the 20 nucleotide sequence Um, to specify uh, where double-stranded breaks occur. Okay, so I'll step through this a bunch of times. So first pass, though, um, it's sort of a light version. When Cas9, which is this uh, larger protein that's depicted here, um, is engaged with the guide RNA uh, or that protein RNA complex, um, you know, it's then able to scan double-stranded DNA. Okay, so Cas9 plus our, our guide RNA will scan double-stranded DNA. And when it's scanning the double-stranded DNA, what it's looking for is a three-nucleotide sequence that is referred to as a PAM. So it looks for a three-nucleotide sequence that's referred to as a PAM. And PAM stands for a protospacer. Uh, adjacent motif. And this will only make sense if you go uh, look up at how the whole CRISPR-Cas system is uh, set up in bacteria. Suffice to say, each type of Cas has a preferred PAM sequence. In the case of SPI-Cas, it's um, um, NGG, Um, and this is our phi prime. So phi prime NGG. And that's depicted here. So we're going phi prime and the sequence is NGG. 
So what happens? The protein RNA complex does its double a scan of the double-stranded DNA, looking for a PAM sequence. When it finds that PAM sequence, it then asks whether the DNA sequence adjacent to the PAM is complementary to the guide. And um, basically, that's what's illustrated in this figure. So once the PAM is recognized, there's this sort of querying of the adjacent DNA sequence for complementarity to the guide. Now, if there is extensive complementarity over the 20 nucleotides of the guide sequence, this then promotes unwinding of the double-stranded DNA. And um, this is what's shown right here. Okay. So we get unwinding. Okay, um, so we look for the PAM. We um, then ask if sequence adjacent um, is complementary. to uh, the guide sequence. And then that leads to unwinding. So essentially we have the target strand of the double-stranded DNA um, is alleled, annealed to the guide, and then the non-target strand is displaced, sort of a uh, displacement loop, you know, kind of similar uh, to what we saw earlier with strand invasion. And once we arrive at this unwound structure, uh, the enzyme is now competent to catalyze a double strand incision. So in the case of spy cas 9 the incision is blunt-ended and the backbone cleaves, cleavages happen three nucleotides, five prime of the PAM. Okay, so you can see the cuts by these uh, black boxes with the arrows here, and they occur uh, five prime, three nucleotides uh, upstream of PAM. So as we'll see in a moment, the non-target strand um, is cleaved by endonuclease domain that's referred to as RAV-C. That's depicted here. And then the target strand is cleaved by a nucle uh, nuclease domain referred to HNH. And that's depicted here. So concerted double strand cleavage results in a double strand break. And now we've catalyzed double strand break uh, at a targeted sequence. So then the, um, then the enzyme cuts um, and the incision is uh, blunt ended. So a couple of things to keep in mind here, uh, you know, like you can program this very pre precisely by changing the sequence of the 20 nucleotide guide, right? Uh, like that makes a certain amount of sense. You can specify whatever sequence you want. It is, however, limited by the presence of a PAM. So your target sequence in whatever genome you're going to try to cleave has to be adjacent to a PAM sequence. So that does limit, to some extent, the selection of potential sites for cleavage by SPYCAS9 because you absolutely have to have this PAM uh, adjacent uh, to your guide uh, sequence. So there's a couple of ways that people try to get around this, and one of them is that Cas9s or Cases from other ba uh, bacteria have different PAM sequences, and it's also possible to engineer spy Cas9 to change the specificity of its PAM sequence. So there are, are some strategies for making a broader number of sites or potential cleavage sites uh, accessible to CRISPR-Cas. Okay, so um, so you need your target sequence. To be adjacent to a PAM. 
um, for it to work. The next thing I want to do is have a look at the protein. So what I'm going to show you here are a couple of structures. And on the left is bycast 9 in the APO state. That's written down here. And so this is just the protein with no guide RNA bound. So minus the guide RNA. And on the right is also SpyCast9, and it is bound with the guide RNA. So plus the guide RNA. And that's shown over here in yellow. And a target strand that's kind of shown in this darker color over here. Okay. And so the first thing that's evident is that the engagement of the guide RNA results in a huge conformational change in the Cas9 protein. So it really moves things around. So to orient you, um, you know, just as I, I, uh, I mentioned, there are two nuclease domains in Cas9. So the two nucleases, um, one is right here, the HNN, HNH, sorry, in green, and then the other one, which is rough C in blue. Okay, so major thing between these two structures, if you have engagement of the guide RNA, uh, you get a conformational change in the structure. So again, in the April state, without a guide RNA bound, there's a, sort of a couple of interesting, interesting structural properties. The first is that the HNH domain is not in its proper catalytic conformation. So not in uh, the proper catalytic conformation. The second is that the HNH domain is actually positioned such that it inhibits rough C. So it inhibits rough C. So if you had to guess, uh, would you guess that the APO state is capable of cleaving double-stranded DNA? Um, hopefully you guess you would guess that it's not right because one nuclease is occluded by the other and the first nuclease is not in a proper catalytic conformation to begin with. So the APO state is not competent to catalyze DNA cleavage. So no uh, DNA cleavage. Uh, the third property in the sapel state is right around here in the C-terminal domain, and that's the region that normally recognizes the PAM. So this is the PAM recognition region, and in the APO state, it's largely disordered. So PAM recognition region is disordered. in the APO state, okay? Um, so the other aspect of this APO state is not only does it not cleave DNA, it can't even look for a PAM because its PAM recognition site is not in a proper ordered conformation. So that, I guess, is sort of the rule of CRISPR-Cas. And that's basically that APO-Cas9 uh, is inactive. It can't recognize the target DNA because it can't scan for PAMs because the PAM recognition region uh, is disordered and it's also incapable of cleaving DNA. So what about when we go from the APO state to um, bound, being bound to the guide uh, RNA? Well, this leads to, again, a large conformational change, as I mentioned. Um, which you hope, which I hope you can see that these two st structures do not even look like uh, they're the same protein. And what this does when it binds the guide RNA, it converts the Cas9 from its inactive APO state into a form that's competent to recognize DNA. 
Um, and so the key to this uh, sort of recognition is twofold. Um, the first is that we get rearrangement uh, of the structure, and this allows for the creation of a channel. So a channel is formed. Um, and again, this channel is allowed or is able to bind the target DNA. So the conformational change reveals this channel that binds the target uh, DNA. Okay, so number one, rearrangement. Uh, creates a channel. Uh, that binds our target DNA. And then the second thing it does, it also orders the PAM recognition uh, region. So it orders the PAM recognition region. And so the initial binding of Cas9 to the guide um, allows it to now scan the DNA sequences uh, for a PAM. So it scans DNA uh, for a PAM. And this PAM scan thing is a, a very dynamic state, so it rapidly binds and dissociates uh, from DNA. So rapidly binds dissociates uh, from DNA. And then once it finds a PAM, then it can catalyze unwinding of the duplex. And then you get unwinding. So then the, that sort of makes a transition from its search mode into its destroy mode. So once it finds the PAM, target strand unwinding commences, and then you're in a position when the, where the target strand can be interrogated as to whether it is complementary to the guide. So, you know, the goal of unwinding is basically you know, asking the question, is the target uh, strand complementary to the guide? And then, so we basically look for complementarity. So sort of rule two of CAS is that you sort of consider these steps in which this is happening. You can't search for the PAM unless you have the guide engaged. And the sort of uh, flip side of this is that if there's no PAM in the target, you don't proceed to the unwinding step. So no PAM, no binding, or at least no stable long-term binding. Okay, so we interrogate the sequence to see whether it's complementary to the guide. If it is, we get extensive unwinding such that we have annealing over the 20 nucleotides of the guide. This then causes conformational changes, and what those conformational changes do is they position the nuclease domains for cleavage. Okay, so let's just reiterate. We engage the guide. We have a conformational change that creates a channel and allows us to search target sequences for a PAM. If a PAM is encountered, that promotes a further sort of conformational transition where the target sequence is unwound. If the target sequence is complementary to the guide, um, that sort of promotes uh, the final conformational change such that the Cas9 reaches its ultimate active state and catalyzes cleavage of the two strands. So just to put this all together in sort of a blob form, um, we basically start over here with the APO state. Uh, the APO state is inactive because the HNH is not in its proper conformation. The HNH is also blocking the ROV-C domain. So, um, you know, that's all sort of over here. And then, you know, the PAM recognition region is uh, disordered, so that can't even occur. Um, we, when we engage the guide, uh, which is depicted here, we're now in a position where the enzyme complex is capable of scanning for target sequences, and what it's looking for is a PAM, right? So, you know, we're able to bind our target DNA, we get the creation of that channel, um, the PAM recognition region becomes ordered, and we can now scan for um, uh, that PAM region. So, 
in this figure here, if it does find a PAM, then we start to transition to, you know, the unwinding form, um, which is starting down here and also here. And um, the unwinding really starts proximal to the PAM and moves away from it. Um, so you might infer uh, from that perhaps, you know, complementary complementarity uh, closest to the PAM is important. Okay, so complementarity uh, close to the PAM is important. Um, and, you know, once extensive unwinding occurs, um, then we kind of end up with this, you know, uh, final uh, structure here, uh, catalytically it's competent, um, you know, where the HNH nuclease um, can cleave, you know, the target strand, um, and the rough C uh, domain can cleave the non-target strand. And that is all the hype, all the excitement. All it does is make a double-stranded break. So anything engineering-wise that happens is happening through the normal cellular double uh, DNA double-strand break repair processes, right? So all CRISPR-Cas uh, does is make the break. So many alterations to the sequence engineered um, or otherwise occur by virtue of the repair processes. So we've made a double-stranded break. How do we repair it now? Probably at least two possibilities, right? We can do uh, non-homologous end joining, or we can do homology uh, directed repair. So if we do non-homologous end joining, um, so if we go down on this side uh, of the figure, we're going to bind Q, right? So we're going to bind uh, Q. And, you know, we're not going to resect anything, so we're going to do N-hedge. And there's a few possible outcomes, right? Uh, one is that the ends of the double-stranded break could synapse accurately, uh, become ligated, and the original strand, the sequence that was present will be uh, restored, right? Um, so what happens if you do that and you still have CRISPR-Cas9 present? Well, the only conclusion is, is that it's going to cut again, right? Because all of the DNA sequence elements that specified its original cleavage are still there. So it's going to cut again. Okay, so if we bind Q, we're going to go down N hedge. Um, you know, if you have simple rejoining, um, that leads to, you know, Cas9 cutting again. Now, if by contrast you have a scenario where you have one of these sorts of kind of inaccurate synapses that we discussed, where you insert or delete a few nucleotides, then what is um, going to happen in the presence of CRISPR-Cas? Well, the short answer is it kind of depends, right? If you have an alteration that changes the sequence of the PAM, then it's absolutely absolutely not going to cut because remember, no PAM, no binding, right? Um, if you have a small insertion or deletion that changes the sequence of the 20 nucleotide guide uh, that it anneals to, you will also um, will not recognize that appropriately, right? So you may still get the binding event via the PAM recognition, but once you get to some winding where you know the sequence is queried, um, there will be some mismatches. So it won't be a proper match. Um, the enzyme won't proceed to this catalytic uh, component state uh, uh, where the DNA becomes cut. So here are our random insertions or deletions, and basically um, these lead to modifications in complementarity to the 20 nucleotide guide. And likewise, if um, the repair changes the PAM, um, you'll get no subsequent cleavage. All right, 
So just to reiterate, so if the repair results in a sequence change that alters um, either or changes uh, the PAM or the 20 nucleotide sequence that the guide is targeting, you'll get no subsequent cleavage. Now, if you uh, reconstitute the original sequence, again, you get cleavage. So this is one way in which CRISPR-Cas is used to inactivate a gene, because if you have a cleavage event, um, and if you repair it accurately, you get cleavage. But if your repair is inaccurate, um, you don't get subsequent cleavage. And the inaccurate repair um, has to have resulted in a sequence alteration. So a sequence alteration in which some number of bases are inserted or deleted, um, occurs. So if we wanted to inactivate a gene, how many nucleotides would we want to insert or remove? Well, let's just think about the case if we delete three nucleotide, three nucleotides. So that's going to result in a small in-frame deletion, right? Just one amino acid. So that's probably not going to do anything. So basically, if you insert or delete one or two, uh, which results in a frame shift, probably you'll get some kind of truncation product and hopefully a non-functional gene. So, you know, it's one way you can use CRISPR-Cas uh, to inactivate uh, a gene. The next question I'll ask is, is there any guarantee when you go down this non-homologous end joining pathway as to what kind of deletions or insertions you're going to get? No, right? Um, we did go through this example. It's kind of random. So the whole use of CRISPR-Cas for knockouts is fraught with a certain amount of peril because what people call knockouts aren't actually knockouts. They're gene disruptions. And so often people will try to improve by way of example you know, say there's um, a, a gene that's encoded for by three axons, right? Um, and, you know, you want to inactivate the gene. If I'm going to do a good experiment in yeast, basically uh, what I want to do is delete the whole thing, uh, which is actually a knockout, right? Um, now, if you're going to do this with CRISPR-Cas, uh, nine in a mammalian cell, um, this is not what people typically do. They would say, um, you know, target a guide often somewhere in the first axon that would uh, result in a, a frame shift. Um, then you would still get RNA made, but the RNA then gets spliced, and then when you get to translation, because now there's a frame shift, you know, you get a truncated protein, right? So that's the theory. Unfortunately, there's all kinds of stuff, of other stuff that cells do. Um, they can, you know, initiate translation at internal sites, so they can skip exons entirely. Um, so there's other processes that are at play here. I sp suspect that there will be some day of reckoning with a lot of CRISPR-Cas uh, disruptions because they're not really knockouts. They're mostly frame shift mutations. So that is the typical road, you know, to uh, engineering a gene uh, knockout. But what if we want to make a, a specific a sequence change um, and we're not satisfied with this randomness or there's something really specific we want to do? Um, so say I have a DNA sequence and there's some code on I want to change, um, you know, the code on XX x to y y y and that changes amino acid you know a to b and all i care about is the b form for some reason um it's very unlikely that you're going to get this kind of specific change by non-homologous end joining uh repair right um you can make a break in that region that you want to change but the outcome is going to be very uh difficult to control so um how do you you control for the outcome so that's the question control the outcome. And we've already discussed this. You know, the one way that um, we can control the outcome is by supplying um, the repair template to the cell. So in this instance, you know, I might want to also transfect these cells with a recombinant piece of DNA um, that is identical uh, to the sequence here and here. But now in the middle, instead of encoding, you know, XXX, it encodes YYY. 
and if the repair template is used by um, the homology directed repair pathway, this then results in the change um, where the original sequence uh, uh, to the sequence that you've specified uh, in the repair template. Okay, so you can supply the template for repair instead. Uh, of leaving it for random repair. And you can specify essentially any alteration you want, right? Essentially, uh, you can change codons. So change codons. Um, you can change a DNA sequence to another DNA sequence of the same length. Uh, change sequence. You can insert DNA. So for example, if you wanted to insert sequences uh, encoding a fluorescent protein tag, you could design your homology or your repair template such, such that there's a um, homology to promote the strand invasion on the ends, but in the middle is DNA sequ uh, sequences for GFP, say. And then the result at the end of the day with the repair event that you want is that the GFP encoding sequences become fused to your gene in situ. Um, you can use it also to delete regions, right? Same sort of thing. So delete regions. So basically in this way you can use homology directory repair to promote specific sequence alterations rather than the sort of more of a stochastic alterations that you would get through non-homologous end joining. So on the one hand, uh, homologous directory repair has potential for uh, greater precision because by providing the repair template, you want, um, you can specify the alteration. So uh, homologous repair, you have greater precision to specify uh, alterations. Um, the hitch in mammalian cells is that, uh, remember that I mentioned HDR is inefficient. So mammalian cells greatly prefer to do non-homologous end joining as their route to double-stranded double break repair. So the result of that is it's a lot easier to inactivate a gene via, via N-hedge rather than it is to alter a gene specifically via homology directed repair event. All right, but um, so note that HDR or H R is inefficient in mammalian cells. And they prefer N hedge. All right, so now what I want to talk about is sort of a clinical application of doing these kinds of editing. And then I want to talk about a good application and rather a misguided one from the same event. So this tale begins somewhere in the 2000s, actually it sort of begins a little bit before that, but it has to do with the mode by which HIV infects human T cells. And the way HIV infects human T cells is that it uses a cell surface receptor uh, called CCR5, which is depicted over here on the side, that functions in combination with another major T cell surface receptor, uh, CD4. So uh, these two in combination. Um, so most strains of HIV require the CCR5 in order to enter cells. So it's a cell surface receptor uh, for a lot of uh, strains um, of HIV. And it turns out in the human population, uh, there's a naturally occurring allele of CCR5 in which, um, you know, 32 base pairs are deleted. Okay, so in the human population, uh, population, there is an allele 
of CCR5 um, with a 32 base pair deletion. So um, it also has this acronym, a Delta 32. And its allele frequency is about uh, 1%, as indicated here. So if you were homozygous for the allele, um, it actually confers resistance to HIV infection. So if you're homozygous, Uh, for the allele, it confers uh, resistance to HIV. And so uh, the story begins in 2019 when an HIV patient was essentially cured of HIV and the mode of the cure was that you have an HIV patient. Um, so in 20, 2009, um, there was a patient that was cured of HIV. Um, so basically you have this patient who has HIV and you have a stem cell donor that is at least re reasonably matched to the recipient. And it just happened that the stem cell donor was a uh, homozygous for the allele of the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. Okay, so you have your HIV positive patient plus a stem cell donor who is homozygous for the CCR5. Uh, uh, Delta 32 uh, mutation. Okay, so that indicates that he was homozygous. And uh, when the patient was reconstituted with stem cells from the D32, D32 donor, uh, the patient was now HIV resistant. So the patient uh, became HIV resistant. So if you extend the idea just a little tiny bit, um, it's not that complicated to see how you can make this kind of thing a into a treatment, right? Um, in this instance, it depends on having a matched donor that is a mutant that has a mutant for CCR5, um, and that's really going to be rare because it's only about one percent um, in the population. And if but if one had a means of editing the patient's own cells, you can imagine a scenario where you remove stem cells from the patient, you edit them to produce the CCR5 Delta 32 allele, and you re reintroduce the edited population into the patient. And now the patient is essentially resistant to H I HIV infection and essentially uh, cured. So um, that's what's actually diagrammed in this figure right here. And it's sort of a strategy, you know, so you could isolate and edit the patient's uh, own cells. And this is um, typically what's called somatic editing. Somatic editing. Uh, in strong contrast to a germline editing, um, this patient will themselves be resistant to HIV, but they would not pass that property on to their offspring, right? Because you're only editing, um, so it's not germline editing. Um, you're only editing their blood cells. Um, and because you're only editing their blood cells, you're not editing their germline, so that's an important distinction, and um, this HIV resistant resistance wouldn't be passed on to their offspring. So the next question becomes is, would such a thing work? And here's an excellent um, experiment where a group at UCSF um, took induced uh, pluripotent stem cells, so pluri
stem cells and introduce um, Cas9, uh, a guide RNA for CCR5. And an HDR template, repair template. Um, that contain the um, Delta 32 um, deletion. So they edited these cells and then they differentiated them to macrophages. And then they infected them with HIV. And um, measured uh, HIV uh, replication. And uh, the results are shown over here in this graph. Um, and of course, they had their control where they did this in comparison to the parental differentiated uh, pluripotent stem cells uh, with no um, um, uh, homologous uh, double-stranded uh, repair template introduced. And basically what you see is um, that the wild type, which is depicted here, um, gets HIV infection and propagation. Whereas those that have the Delta 32, Delta 32 um, mutation introduced um, do not. Okay, so basically, uh, yeah, so Delta 32, Delta 32. So basically what they've done is they've generated cells that are resistant to HIV. So this is actually uh, an exact approach that is now being used in the clinic um, in a genome uh, editing, uh, engineering sense. So the idea, again, is to remove some cells from the patient, edit in vitro, reintroduce the edited cells back into the patient. So that's what's currently in trial. So it's a current um, uh, trial in use. So that's a pretty good use, uh, right? Uh, and it makes a lot of sense. And it's treating uh, patients that have a disease. So it's a positive effect. Um, <clears throat> oops. Positive effect. And of course, it's a serious disease. So there's a uh, good potential here. And now for the bad version of this, um, and is it's as you can imagine, if you decide to edit um, the germline on a couple of embryos and then grow them into human beings, and I want you to really think about why this is a bad idea. Okay, so it's a bad idea uh, editing uh, the germline. So let's maybe start with what, as near as I can tell, uh, was done, and then we could talk a little bit about whether this represents sound scientific thinking. So, and the first step was they designed a guide RNA to recognize a region of CCR5 very near the start of the Delta 32 deletion. So that makes a certain amount of sense. Um, they introduced the Cas9 plus the guide into the embryos very soon after fertilization and then again at the two cell stage. Uh, they looked at the mutation at the CCR5 locus and they also looked at a bunch of additional sites that they were concerned um, might be sort of off-target editing sites. Um, they identified the CCR5 edits, implanted a couple of embryos and uh, grew a couple of humans. Um, so what's missing from their experimental workflow? Like what kind of repair of their CRISPR-Cas CCR5 double-strand break are they going to see? 
So think about it. Is there uh, any repair template being introduced here? No, right? Okay, so there is no repair template. So what does that infer? Um, so basically, um, this is only going to be repaired by non-homologous end joining, right? So we're going to um, use non-homologous end joining to do the repair. And um, it's only going to result at best in small insertions or deletions, and it's going to be somewhat random, right? So it's entirely unlikely that they would ever recreate the Delta 32 mutation by this uh, route. So um, this will be random. Um, there's no expectation. Uh, they would get the Delta 32 mutation. So the approach is flawed uh, right from the get-go because there's no expectation they would get the precise uh, mutation Delta 32, which has been extensively characterized clinically and is known to exist at a decent frequency in the human population, right? So basically, they're making what are termed variants of unknown significance. So they are making variants of unknown uh, significance. A uh, couple of little side notes at the bottom here. Um, the father of the children in these cases was um, HIV positive. The mother was HIV negative. So the risk to the child during childbirth is uh, extremely low. Um, there's also lots of ways to avoid HIV infection. So basically, they're treating a patient that doesn't have the disease. So they're treating a patient who doesn't have the disease. doing so in a scenario where there's a lot of better strategies for preventing the patients from acquiring the disease. And then on top of that, if you want, really want to be amused, uh, the consent, consent documents are bizarre. Um, they basically discuss vaccination, not editing. So the consent process was totally sketchy. Okay, so the consent um, was totally sketchy. Scientists occasionally think about these matters and decide what would be reasonable if we're going to do germline editing, gene editing. So uh, we can kind of walk through these, right? And this is from the National Academy of Sciences in the US. Um, the first, you know, absence of reasonable alternatives. Obviously, there were many reasonable alternatives, so we fail on that. Um, second, uh, preventing a serious disease. Obviously, HIV is clearly serious, so I think we're probably okay there. Um, you know, restriction to editing genes that have convincingly been demonstrated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, uh, you know, CCR5 is definitely an HIV co-receptor, so you know the target is okay. So CC, CCR5 target is okay. Um, the next, converting genes to versions that are prevalent in the population. So this is true for Delta 32, but it's absolutely not true for some random NHEDGE uh, gene edit, right? So it's true for the Delta 32, but uh, not NHEDGE uh, variants. And then finally, um, you know, credible preclinical or clinical data with respect to the edit. And likewise, again, this is true for um, 
the delta 32, but not uh, true for um, NHETCH edits. If you also want to see what the edit, actual edits look like, it's kind of appalling actually, uh, and they're depicted here on the side, and here's why. Um, so we have the wild type, which is depicted up here. Um, here's the delta 32, and this is actually uh, one of the kids, so one kid. And um, with this child, we have a 15 base pair, uh, base pair uh, deletion, right? And it's homozygous for it. Um, so, what's the effect of a 15 base pair deletion going to be? Well, um, the first answer is who knows, right? Um, so, who knows the effect? Um, and that's because, you know, the variants have never been studied before. Um, there's pretty strong potential that the receptor is going to, to still be made and is simply going to be lacking about five amino acids. So that's sort of a bizarre choice to even continue forward with um, uh, if you were looking for something that would inactivate that particular receptor. And then the second child, um, which is depicted here, so the second uh, kid, is a heterozygous or, or mosaic. Um, one allele has a four base pair deletion. So four base pair deletion. And then one has a one base pair uh, insertion. So it's exactly what you would expect, right, from non-homologous end joining uh, repair processes is that you're going to get a mixed bag of small insertions or small uh, deletions, right? And it's certainly not going to be particularly uh, predictable. So again, this is not predictable. And so to end from a clinical perspective, what they've actually done is created three alleles so three alleles of uh, CCR5, whose significance is unknown. All right, so just to summarize some of the things that we talked about in this lecture, uh, we delved into double-stranded uh, breaks, which are repaired by homologous recombination or um, N-hedge or non-homologous end-joining um, as dictated by end resection. Um, we talked about how homologous recombination uh, repairs uh, by copying an intact homologous template, whereas end-joining um, and hedge, sorry, rejoins ends with minimal processing. We delved into CRISPR-Cas9, which is a nucleic acid programmable site-specific endonuclease. And we finally ended off with some genome editing and um, how that relies on cellular uh, double-stranded break repair pathways. And on this last slide, I'll just leave you with a couple of resources if you want to delve into further uh, uh, into the work that we just described about the hum human uh, genome editing uh, that occurred a few years ago.